Section 3 of chapter 30 covers the idea of magnetic flux. Now I'm going to skip over some of the basics because magnetic flux has a lot in common with electric flux, which we previously covered. So I want to start with the most general situation and then work towards a simplified situation, which is what we're normally going to get to use. So if we have a non-uniform magnetic field, note that this would be true also in the case where the magnetic field is uniform, but if the magnetic field is not uniform, we can't possibly simplify this. We need to actually do the integral. And we have the dot product between the magnetic field, where in this case it would be defined as a function of position, and then dA, where this is going to be a very small area and the direction is perpendicular to the surface. And in this case, we're thinking about our surface being kind of the surface area of the inside of this loop. So that would be our magnetic flux. We have to do this surface integral of the dot product. That seems a little complicated. So the good news is we are very rarely going to need to do that. There are two simplifications we can make. If the magnetic field is uniform, then when you think about doing this integral, it's going to simplify to be the dot product between our magnetic field and the area vector. Now note that the area vector is uh, perpendicular to the surface. Um, and this dot product, remember, can just be defined as the magnitude of these two vectors multiplied by cosine of the angle in between them. Again, always make sure that you get the direction of your area vector correct. Now, if your magnetic field is perpendicular to the surface, then that simplifies into a multiplication problem. Very simply, no angle whatsoever. Um, but that has to do with cosine of zero being one. So this is the general statement. You must use this form if your magnetic field is not uniform. And in any other situations, we get to simplify it quite a bit. And in this class, you are almost always going to be able to use one or the other of these. Um, so I would encourage you to use this as kind of your um, default. Um, but remember that this is a simplified form of this equation. So the idea is when we go to say something like this, that we're always talking about the flux through some sort of loop. So you always have to be defining what that loop is and then thinking about the area of the surface that is contained within that loop. So there's a few uh, notational things that I, I want to make sure you understand. Again, this area vector, which we have seen before when we talked about electric flux, has the magnitude of the area of whatever surface you're talking about, um, and it points perpendicular to the surface. So think, think of this as pointing out. One thing with electric flux, when we did Gauss's law, it was an enclosed surface, so for instance, a sphere. Now with magnetic flux, it's going to be the surface of a loop, so think disk. So electric flux, you had a sphere. Magnetic flux, you're going to have like a disk. The units of magnetic flux are Weber's. Notice that this has Tesla in it, so this isn't true for all flux. This is only for magnetic flux. Um, don't feel like you really need to remember that it's the Weber. Feel free to just say Tesla times meter squared. And obviously the meter squared comes because this is magnetic field times an area or integrated over an area. If you have a problem where you have both electric and magnetic flux, uh, there's a situation in a later chapter where this will come up quite a bit make sure that you use a subscript to denote it. So capital Phi or capital Phi gets used for flux, either electric or magnetic. So if you want to have it right, make sure that you put sub E for electric. Now the book uses sub M for magnetic, but if you use sub B, that will be pretty clear as well that you mean magnetic for that. So just be careful about this. Um, again, make sure that you understand the equations on the equation sheet, what is what, and if you're especially doing a problem that has both, make sure you use subscripts. So visually, I want to run through um, a couple of simple situations. One is where you actually have zero degrees. And remember again that your area vector is perpendicular to the surface. So in this case, you have zero degrees between your magnetic field and your area vector. So you have in all of these cases a uniform magnetic field. We don't have to do the integral. We can just multiply. So in this case where you have your uh, simple theta equals zero situation, the area is given times a, b, lowercase a, b, coming from the uh, just the size of your 
rectangle here, the loop, it doesn't have to be a circular loop. This rectangular loop is fine as well. Multiplied by the magnitude of your magnetic field. Now, if we've tilted the loop a little bit, there's kind of two ways to think about. One is to just use the equation, right? That now, instead, we would say that this is equal to our area vector dot b, which is going to be equal to a b capital B, sorry about all of the confusing notation here, cos theta. But another way to do this is to just look at the sideways project projection of this, right? That this is what's kind of face on. And so this side, instead of being b, becomes b cos theta. So that's again another way of interpreting a dot product. If we turn it all the way so that none of these arrows are quote unquote going through the loop, now, this is a theta of 90 degrees. Cosine of 90 is zero. You have zero flux in this situation. So the takeaway from this is be able to identify situations where you have zero flux, be able to identify situations where you have maximal flux, theta equals zero, and then in all other situations, you can just use this area times magnetic field cosine theta.